Good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center here at the Kennedy School, and it's my great uh, honor to welcome you here tonight. We are uh, very pleased to, to have such a distinguished uh, guest, but we also are very happy to have uh, an almost uh, equally unusual event, a MIT professor who's come down to uh, Harvard not only to uh, be with us, but to serve as the introducer and as the uh, the moderator of the discussion. I only want to remind people that this is a normal Kennedy School forum event. After the ambassador's comments, there'll be an opportunity for people to give to have, make questions. But we have in the forum, by tradition, only one speech an evening. And the speech is being given by our guests. So anybody who's come to speak on some other subject, they've come the wrong night and to the wrong place and they will not have an opportunity to do so. They're welcome to ask any question on any topic that they're interested in, as long as it's brief. So thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Graham. It's my privilege to introduce to you His Royal Highness Turkey Al Faisal. Uh, he is Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States. He has been ambassador here since September 2005. Before that, he was Saudi Arabia's ambassador to Great Britain from 2000, I guess, two to 2005. From 1977 to 2001, Prince Turkey was Director General of the General Intelligence Directorate of Saudi Arabia, their Foreign Intelligence Service. He was my counterpart when I was Director of Central Intelligence during 1995 and 1996. We had considerable interaction during that time. And during this period, we addressed subjects which were very important to US interests and to Saudi interests and to matters in the region. I developed great respect for Prince Turkey, his experience, his wisdom, and his perspectives. His cooperation was most important to me when I was director, and I believe that the cooperation served both our countries extremely well. We are fortunate to have him here with us this evening. Prince Perturki has an unusual perspective. Uh, since he is a uh, person who was educated in the United States, he's a graduate of Georgetown University. I'll point out the same class as President Bill Clinton. We rarely have the opportunity to hear somebody here in Cambridge who is a statesman in the Arab world, who knows it well, and who understands the United States well as he does. So we have an opportunity tonight to hear a very unusual person speak about very important matters. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Thank you very much. His Royal Highness Prince Turkey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala afdal mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Mr. Allison, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to speak before you today. My distinction derives from being invited to talk at the Kennedy School of Government. I would like to thank my good friend, Dr. John Deutsch, for inviting me here as well. While he is often described as a man with a background in intelligence, I would also describe him as a man of intelligence and of great integrity. Thank you, Dr. Deutsch. I'll have more to say about you tomorrow in MIT. <laughs> You'll have to come and listen. I would never have made it to the Kennedy School at Harvard on my scholastic record. So thank God for diplomatic privilege. <laughs> I was told that I should wear something red tonight in celebration of Harvard's crimson colors. So as you can see, I am all over in red. And even my socks are red. It is a pleasure to be in Boston, one of the oldest and most historic cities in the United States, 
and it is an honor for me to be here at the Kennedy School. In September 1962, a revolution backed by President Jamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt erupted in the Yemen. A military socialist regime replaced the traditionalist monarchy and President Kennedy contemplated recognizing the new regime because American officials believed that the Yemeni monarch had been killed in the revolution. The late King Faisal was in New York at the time attending the United Nations session and President Kennedy invited him to Washington to tell him of his decision to recognize the new regime. Over lunch at the White House, the king convinced the president to defer any precipitous action until the, the dust settles. The president, however, insisted, and the king said, we shall see what we shall see. The very next day, the supposedly dead monarch appeared at the Saudi border, alive and well. President Kennedy delayed recognition of the Republican regime and entered an agreement with King Faisal to provide assistance to Saudi Arabia should Nasser threaten the kingdom. That meeting in Washington, successfully built on the groundwork laid by King Abdelaziz and President Roosevelt in 1945 between the United States and Saudi Arabia in the Cold War period and beyond. The meeting between King Abdullah and President Bush in April of last year has further cemented our relationship, giving it strategic momentum that is taking us well into the 21st century. Our countries have had a long and mutually successful partnership for more than 60 years. This relationship has weathered many storms and continues to grow and deepen as we work together to meet the many challenges facing the world today. I would like to address one of the most important of these challenges the threat of terrorism. As we are all aware, terrorism threatens all governments, nations, peoples, and families. We are all targets. In the case of Al-Qaeda, the terrorists seek to destroy the long-standing relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Through acts of violence and horrific crimes, Osama bin Laden aims to destabilize our country overthrow the established order, and take over Saudi Arabia, the home of the two holy mosques. Al-Qaeda claims to be faithful to Islam and faithful to God, but they are not. They are an evil cult. Their twisted vision is alien to the healthy body of the faith that holds the world's Muslim community together. Al-Qaeda further opposes us because we are trying to move our country forward to modernize and become part of the world economy. Saudi Arabia recently became an official member of the World Trade Organization. This is a significant step as we continue to modernize, but it does not make us popular among those elements who, who aim to darken our lives with their twisted vision. But these evildoers will never, ever succeed. That I can assure you. The Saudi government and our people are galvanized in an effort to uproot the terrorists and eradicate them from wherever in the world they may attempt to hide. Ladies and gentlemen, the threat of terrorism is great and we must continue to stand together in our fight against it. One of the best known verses in the Quran, our holy book, tells us, مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ Whoever kills a person without justification or commits sacrilege on earth, it would be as if he killed all of mankind. No greater statement can sum up the effect of terrorism on the world today. In Saudi Arabia, we have been fighting terrorism long before September 11, 2001. But during the last three years alone, Saudi Arabia has witnessed more than 25 terrorist attacks, including explosions, murders, and kidnappings, causing the death of more than 140 human beings, innocent human beings, while injuring more than 500 innocent people. Saudi Arabia has enacted a three-pronged approach to combat this evil. 
We're going after the men, the money, and the mindset that support terrorism. First, we are relentlessly pursuing the terrorists themselves. During the last three years, more than 800 suspects have been arrested. 120 terrorists have been killed and 17 wounded. And over 50 terrorist operations were foiled. These accomplishments, however, have not come without a cost. More than 90 Saudi security officers have been killed. And over 200 have been wounded in the line of duty. Our country will be forever grateful for the sacrifices they have made to enhance the safety of our nation. To help us in the pursuit of the terrorists, we established a joint task force with US officials to share information, resources, and technology. Today, the work of this task force, where Saudis and US officials work side by side, is a model for international cooperation that is being emulated in other countries. Second, we're going after the finances of terror. Saudi Arabia has instituted some of the toughest financial and banking regulations in the world to ensure that money cannot be diverted or passed into the wrong hands. We have also established a financial intelligence unit, which is cooperating with the US and other governments to go after global financial support for terrorists and their money laundering operations. The Saudi government is also working with agents from the United States Internal Revenue Service and the FBI. We sit by side by side with their Saudi they sit by side by side with their Saudi counterparts to analyze important streams of data at the Joint Terrorist Financial Task Force in Riyadh. This second task force has also been a great success. And third, we are going after the mindset that foments and justifies acts of terrorism. As the birthplace of Islam and the site of the two holy mosques, Saudi Arabia has a moral responsibility to defend our religion against those who would subvert and usurp it. Last February, we initiated a public awareness campaign to reinforce the true values of the Islamic faith and to educate Saudi citizens about the dangers of extremism and terrorism, including the effects of providing support to terrorist and extremist organizations. The campaign is featured in advertisements on, the, on television, radio, and billboards, as well as programs on television in schools and mosques, and even at sporting events. One of the centerpieces of the campaign is a series of public service announcements that has aired up to 25 times a day on a number of Arab satellite networks, including Al Arabiya, NBC, and Future Television, as well as on Saudi TV channels. The size and scope of the campaign is unprecedented, with six government ministries coordinating the development and execution of the programs. In school, our children attend lectures sponsored by the Ministry of Education, promoting moderation and peace. They are educated about the dangers of extremism. Our message is clear. Intolerance, violence, and extremism are not part of our Islamic faith or Saudi culture and traditions. I know that in Boston, the first public school in the US, Boston Latin Grammar School, was founded in 1635. And the first college in the US, here at Harvard, founded in 1636. That was more than 300 years ago. By contrast, just 60 years ago, Saudi Arabia had less than 10 schools. 40 years ago, we only had one university. Now, however, the kingdom has 11 universities, some 25,000 schools, and a large number of college and technical institutions that our system provides every Saudi with free education, books, and health services. We have come very far in a short time. But despite the speed of our progress, we know that we must continue to improve and modernize our education system. To achieve that goal, we undertook a strategic plan that is making changes through the removal of intolerant material from textbooks 
the introduction of new texts and teaching methods, and the retraining of educators. This program is consistent with the need to prepare our citizens for life and work in a modern global economy, as well as the necessity to prevent our children from being influenced by extremism and intolerance. Saudi Arabia, ladies and gentlemen, will not allow Islam to be perverted or twisted to condone criminal acts that are unjustifiable. King Abdullah has affirmed we must put our Islamic house in order. That is why last December, leaders and heads of state from 57 Arab and Islamic nations came together in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia, to answer a call by King Abdullah at the third extraordinary summit of the Organization of the Islamic Conference to address the future of the Islamic community. An open and honest dialogue ensued, and real steps to reform were agreed upon, covering the areas of intellectual thought, politics, and the economy and society. The Islamic community is ensuring the integrity of its faith through strategic planning intended to safeguard the interests of the Muslim world against extremist threats. The conference concluded with the approval of a 10-year strategic plan of reforms, which are marked by moderation, modernization, and tolerance. A year ago, the Kingdom also hosted an international counter-terrorism conference in Riyadh, which brought together some 60 nations, including the U.S. They worked together to draft common and practical recommendations to fight terrorism and its causes. The conference also expressed approval for King Abdullah's initiative to create an international terrorism center to act as a hub for counter-terrorism data. The sharing and exchanging of information is necessary to deter and prevent terrorist acts and to stay ahead of our mutual enemy at all times. The international community must come together to a far greater extent. We are a global community and our neighbors' peace, stability and prosperity is as important as our own. Thus, in the Middle East, we must work together to create stability and foster peace where instability and violence serve to exacerbate the, terrible, the terrorist threat. We must find a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Until the Palestinians are finally given justice and their own homeland, where they can live in peace, this situation will remain not just a tragedy, but it will also provide terrorists with an excuse for their horrific actions. We must also work to ensure that the Iraqi people achieve stability and security. Saudi Arabia remains fully committed to this effort. The Kingdom has convened meetings among Iraqi factions to help them reach an agreement on a common future in which Iraq's unity and territorial in integrity are preserved and in which all Iraqis are treated justly. The steps Saudi Arabia has taken also include efforts to seal our border with Iraq. It is a vast expanse of desert to cross, and we have spent billions of dollars to ensure our borders are secure with new fencing, barbed wire, and motion detectors. Also, thermal imaging systems that can see miles into the desert. Ladies and gentlemen, the war on terrorism has a great impact on the average Saudi citizen. First, there are the many changes to our daily lives and routines, such as the roadblocks and checkpoints set up in many of our cities. Barbed wire and blockades now spoil public areas, and machine gun nests are placed near government buildings, residential compounds, hotels, and high traffic areas. The kingdom is in a constant state of alert. But in addition to these daily sacrifices, Saudis must face something deeper. Our national character has been marred in the eyes of the world. As a result of the actions of a few deranged criminals, Saudi Arabia, its people and culture have been called into question. As a result, there exists much misunderstanding about Saudi society and culture. Many myths have emerged in recent years that are misleading about how we live and who we are. 
One myth is that we export a brand of extremism known as Wahhabism. The West largely misunderstands what Wahhabism is. The term refers to the reformist views of the 18th century Arabian scholar, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Wahhab, one of my grandfathers. He did not advocate the killing of the innocent or condone acts of suicide. Individuals like Osama bin Laden may claim their origins in Wahhabism, but their faith is perverted, just like David Koresh or Jim Jones' perverted Christianity to justify their evil acts. Are the Saudi people conservative? Yes. Are we traditional? Yes. Are we extremists? Absolutely not. Another myth concerns the falsehoods that were dis disseminated about the flights that carried some Saudis after 9-11 when American Air Force and airspace were closed. This myth was at best a figment of the imagination and at worst an attempt to incriminate. The 9-11 Commission found that no planes departed before American airspace was opened up, that these flights were properly cleared and that, between quotation marks, they concluded that none of the passengers were connected to the 9-11 attacks and have since found no evidence to change that conclusion. Yet another myth is that the Saudi government funded acts of terrorism. Again, the 9-11 Commission report stated, and I quote, we have found no evidence that the Saudi government as an institution or, Saudi or senior Saudi officials individually funded Al-Qaeda. Such myths reinforce misunderstanding, hasten judgment, and cause rifts between people. Terrorism and extremism occur in every faith, every culture, and every civilization. No one is immune. We must remain aware of this fact. And if we succeed in eradicating the terrorist groups of today, of which Al-Qaeda is merely one, we need to ensure that we also make it so that there simply is no place for a terrorist threat in the future. Our cultures, ladies and gentlemen, must be united in our reaction to such savagery. We should have one other goal as well. Long after the threat of terrorism is gone, and God willing it will be gone someday, our nations will still be in this world together. We should look at the time in between as an opportunity to further strengthen our relations and as a time to build greater understanding between our peoples so that at the end we will be stronger for it. The Massachusetts naturalists, Henry David Thoreau advised between quotation marks, be true to your work, your word, and your friend. In this world, with the threats that we face, no sager advice can be given. As long-standing partners, let us move forth in continued friendship and expanding cooperation to handle the important work before us so that someday we will be able to achieve both peace and prosperity for our people. And as we say in Arabic, Ashkurukum shukran jazilan. Thank you all very much. And barakallahu feekum. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the ambassador will take some questions uh, on subjects he's spoken about or anything else. I ask only the questions be brief and that you uh, identify yourself when asking the question. We'll begin with you, sir. Hi. My name Hi. is Raul Kabakar, and I'm a student at the college. And uh, you spoke about this in your speech, that many Americans have a negative impression of Saudi Arabia, from 15 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 being Saudis to what we hear of Saudi telethons 
funding families of suicide bombers to what we hear of Wahhabi schools. And you spoke about uniting our cultures, but we live in a free society and your people do not. Is this a distortion by the American media, these myths perpetuated in your words, or is it a reflection of a society that doesn't share our values? Thank you. Before I answer you, I'll relate a story about media. When I was ambassador in London, before coming here, the British press really took us to task in Saudi Arabia, continuously. And the first couple of months or so, they were extremely vehement against Saudi Arabia. So my government sent, a cab sent me a cablegram and said, what are you doing about this? Get off your backside and do something. So I was waited for another couple of months to see what the reaction is in the, in the British press. And they continued to attack the kingdom. And then I sent the cable back to my government saying, it's true that the British press is very negative about Saudi Arabia. But you should see how they treat their own government <laughs> and their own royal family. And I can say the same thing about the American press. Um, Saudi Arabia is not a prison state, if that is the impression that you have. Um, we are a developing country. We came from a long history of division and tribal warfare that disunited us for many years. In 1932, we came together under the leadership of the late King Abdelaziz to establish a state and central government that would hopefully provide services and things like, as I mentioned, free education, free health services, and uh, free books to the people of Saudi Arabia. The development in Saudi Arabia over the last 60 years or 70 years as compared to the development of your country would be like compressing your 270 years of development in just the 70 years that we have developed. Our people are free to travel wherever they want. Our press is increasingly more critical and more dissective of our society and deal with all of the issues that deal with the, with the formation and the development of our society. We have espoused a reform program initiated by the late King Fahad in the year 2003 that is made up of six points of reform. The first one is the definition of our Islamic practice, of our religion, our ethos as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, defined Muslims when he was asked, who are you Muslims? He said, we are people of the middle. And that injunction has been put at the forefront of our religious message in this reform program, whether it is in the mosques, in the schools, universities, or any other public spaces, in the media including. The second reform issue that the king proposed was the widening of the political participation in Saudi Arabia. And the first step in that long road we took just last February and March, which was elections for municipal councils. And in the next term of elections, there will be elections for regional councils. And after that, elections for the consultative assembly, which would be uh, something like your parliament or your congress. And the third point that he stressed in his reform program was that women in Saudi Arabia should have an equal role to play in the development of Saudi Arabia as men. And already all of the job opportunities and educational opportunities, and on that basis I can tell you as it is here true in the United States, more women graduate today from our universities than men do and they far outclass their men colleagues in their scholastic aptitudes. And most recently, women have been elected to the Chambers of Commerce and the Engineers uh, Association and the Journalists Association. And in the next round of municipal elections and other elections, universal suffrage will be the practice, not the exception. 
And on that aspect, I would remind you that it took your country nearly 200 years to achieve universal suffrage. So it's taking us a much shorter time to do that. Also, the fourth point that the king stressed in his reform program was a reform of our educational system. Textbooks have been revised. Skills and job uh, acquisition knowledge has been amplified and strengthened in our colleges and universities so that our graduating uh, scholars and, and students will find uh, jobs easily and can be employed, not just in the kingdom, but wherever they want to be. So they can compete in the, in the world market. The fifth point that the king stressed was the need to invigorate our economic well-being in the kingdom. And in the last two and a half years, the kingdom is going through a boom, not just because oil prices have gone up, but more importantly, because Saudis see opportunities of investment in the kingdom that give them better returns than they would if they invest their money outside. And the sixth point that the king stressed was the streamlining of the government and to make it more efficient and more capable of undertaking these reforms. So ministries have been combined together, other ministries have been eliminated, and generally the productivity of individual workers in government has improved over the last two and a half years. This is just a brief outline of the program of the reform that the king initiated um, in 2003 and which we, in which we are following through. Mr. Ambassador, I'm Shane Christensen, a student here at the Kennedy School, and wanted to ask you if Saudi Arabia has a concern about a possible resurgence of Shia extremism in the re region, given developments in Iran and also the creation of a Shia-led government on your border. We're concerned about any extremism, Shia, Sunnah, or any other. Um, the majority of the people of Iraq are Shia. If they choose a Shia government, that is up to them. We have worked very hard with uh, our Iraqi brethren to try to encourage them uh, to think of themselves more as Iraqi rather than as Shia or Sunnah or Kurd or Turkmen or whatever are the subdivisions of the Iraqi society are. We succeeded in getting a conference held in Cairo last November where all representatives of the Iraqi political and social uh, uh, groups uh, got together and for the first time since the, uh, the toppling of Saddam Hussein and managed to agree on, um, on, uh, on common grounds uh, for uh, not just the elections that took place uh, last January but also hopefully for another meeting of those groups uh, at the end of this month or next month in, in Baghdad. So our efforts are for the Iraqi people to be the decision makers in their fate. Yes, please. My name is Parsa Sajid, and I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School, and I am originally from Bangladesh. And I wanted to ask you to comment on the recent controversy on the cartoons, and whether you think the heads of states in the Arab and the Muslim world could do something to diffuse the tension rather than fueling it. Let me just say that as a Muslim, um, those cartoons were not just insulting uh, to me and, and, and my faith and, and my being, but also uh, absolutely unacceptable. And for the life of me, I don't see how the depiction of our prophet, peace be upon him, as a terrorist or as a provider of so-called virgins to suicide bombers has anything to do with free speech. You're the experts on free speech. We're not. But how can you reconcile the two? I certainly cannot. And definitely the violence and the reaction that has taken place in some Arab and Muslim countries, while there are those within those countries that justify that violence, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia does not. And we are working very hard 
through the Organization of Islamic Conference and the Arab League and the European Union to try to defuse that issue. Uh, Javier Solana, the representative of the European Union, just a couple of days ago, I think, was in Jeddah meeting with the OIC Secretary General and the Arab League Secretary General to try to devise a way to, uh, to put forward something that will allay the passions um, of, the, of these people. In, in public statements that I have made here in the United States and in other places, I've stressed two points. One is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was the victim of violence, as he was preaching among the unbelievers, forgave his, his attackers. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us as Muslims not to be selective in how we follow the Prophet, but to follow in all of his teachings. And definitely, forgiveness is asked in a case like this. And secondly, that the instigators of this issue, whether they be Danish cartoonists, Danish editors, uh, aliens from Mars, or wherever you like, that there must be some kind of recourse against them. In the European Union, I know that there are laws, for example, against those who propagate anti-Semitism. There are laws who propagate uh, against those who propagate uh, offenses against uh, human rights. Why is faith an exception to that? Whether it is Islamic, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, somehow, somewhere, the world community must find a means not to allow whoever wants to instigate this kind of of, of incident to get away with it. All we understand about what happened to the editor who allowed and called for these cartoons is that he was given a couple of weeks off to go on holiday. How can that be? Yani, uh, it is something that is, I think, should be considered seriously by the world community. And I know that in the consultations that are taking place in Saudi Arabia today between the EU, the uh, OIC, and the Arab League, as well as I know the contacts between my government and the Danish government are seeking to find ways to bring forward reason instead of passion. Good evening, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Sebastian Abbott. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, my question actually relates to the first question that was asked and your comments about elections in Saudi Arabia. One of the Bush administration's principal tenets in combating terrorism is democracy promotion. Um, do you feel that uh, the development of democracy in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in the Middle East is a necessary precondition to ultimately uh, combating extremism in the region? I think we must look upon combating extremism in a global way, not simply selecting one or two tools for that. It's not just an issue of, of security or elections or whatever procedures may take place in any society, but actually going at the very root of the, of the cause of the terrorism, whether it be a cult-like uh, group like Al-Qaeda that has developed a, soci uh, a society and, and, and an ethos and a philosophy that condones and encourages the killing uh, of innocents and the taking of, of lives and hostages and, and so on and using terror as a means of achieving whatever aims they may want to, uh, to achieve. So it's not just an issue of, of going to the polling booth that will be the end of, of terrorism. If it were that issue, we would not have found terrorism in Britain um, or in America. I mean, there are terrorists who have operated in America. Uh, I remember th when uh, the July 7th attacks took place in London. I was still ambassador in, uh, in England, and I was, uh, happened to be at a dinner with uh, an ex-minister uh, of state uh, in the foreign office in, in England. And uh, she turned to me and she said, what do these people want? They have uh, 
uh, freedom of speech. They have uh, they can vote in the elections. They um, they can enjoy the benefits of uh, British democracy and British uh, traditions and so on. And I told her, these people are supposed to be acting in the name of Islam, and look at how they've treated Muslims, whether it be in Saudi Arabia, in Morocco, in Indonesia, or whatsoever. These people have allowed themselves to adopt a philosophy that gives them license to kill innocent children and, and, and destroy property and at, at, at their whim, without anybody or any recourse. It's as if they have a direct email line to heaven where they get permission from there to do these things. That's what they claim. So uh, it has to be a global issue, economic uh, well-being, uh, education, um, uh, wider political participation, uh, resolving political disputes like Palestine and Iraq and Kashmir and Chechnya and you name it, uh, that are used as excuses by these people to recruit people and to inflame the passions and the, and the uh, rage and anger of young people and, and send them to kill themselves. That's what it has to be. Good evening. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School and thank you for your remarks. Um, when and how should the United States leave Iraq? <laughs> That's not for me to answer. The only person who can, or the only people who can do that are the Iraqi people. And I think through the political process that has taken place, as I told you, the meeting in Cairo last November, um, the, the, uh, the communique that followed that, that meeting called for the withdrawal of uh, foreign troops from Iraq, but it didn't set a timetable. Nor do I expect that uh, Iraqi leaders will, will set a timetable now. But it is when they feel that they can afford to do that that they will then ask you to leave. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I'm wondering whether... Oh, I'm Tina, a um, student at the college. I'm wondering whether you feel that Saudi Arabia's oil wealth um, has helped to promote long-term economic development, or has it essentially been a resource curse, um, highly segmenting the economy and being paid maybe too easy a source of government revenue? What can I say? I mean, uh, first of all, let me say that, that we're very fortunate uh, to have in our lands a resource that we can sell on the world market to bring us money to develop our, our, ourselves. Uh, the Arabian Peninsula, historically, its major export has been its, its population because it could never sustain um, the existence of, of large uh, human settlements because there are no rivers, uh, no sources of, uh, for, to sustain uh, agriculture and, and other uh, means of uh, survival. In, in that harsh and very uh, difficult uh, geography and, and climate. For the first time in, in, in the history of nearly 10,000 years, the Arabian Peninsula actually attracts people to come in rather than driving them out. And that is because of the oil uh, income. And it is not just Saudi Arabia, but the other Gulf states. Now, it is how you use that oil income uh, in the kingdom we've managed to spend the large majority of it on development issues. Uh, the last two years, with the added income that we've had because of the rise in oil prices, a portion of it went to pay our national debt. Uh, the large majority of it went to increase our, spend, our spending on, uh, on uh, projects to improve the standard of living, whether it be education, as I was mentioning, or health services, or transportation, or industry, or whatever. Today in Saudi Arabia, we have the fastest growing economy uh, in the Middle East. Um, we have the largest economy in the Middle East. Um, the stock market in Saudi Arabia today, I think, is either 10th or, or 11th in terms of its value 
uh, in the world. And, and so, um, some people may consider that a curse. Um, I look upon it as a blessing. I am a product of Saudi Arabian uh, oil income. Uh, Saudi students around you here, I'm sure there are some, are a product of that oil income. If we didn't have that income, there would not be that, that availability of resources to come to Harvard or to go to other places. Hi, my name is Charles Osagano. I'm from the Business School. Uh, just wanted to hear your thoughts on um, some of the root causes of terrorism in Saudi Arabia. One might be, for example, unemployment, high rates of unemployment among men in their 20s. Uh, what, um, what are the specific measures that the government is taking to tackle that, pro that problem? Unemployment, through all of our studies um, of terrorists, particularly in Saudi Arabia, has never been a source for their turn to terrorism. Most of the so-called terrorists that have been either captured or that have been dealt with, if you look back in their history, they were either employed at one time or another or still going to school at one time or another uh, or generally having sources of income that um, allow them to live uh, a comfortable life. The main source of, of terrorism in, 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 in our country is the perverted interpretation of, uh, of Islam, uh, that uh, using the, uh, the, uh, the uh, if you like, open wounds of Palestine and Iraq and, and uh, um, Kashmir and Chechnya and you name it, wherever there is a problem, um, the extension from that is that you have to come to us join us in the fight against the infidels, and uh, if you die, you will go to heaven. That is the basic recruiting methodology. And once that step is taken to join, then the first thing that they do is they cut the person off completely from his family, as all cults do. And once he's cut off from his family, then the next process is to cut him off from his society and it follows from there in, uh, in progression. So uh, unemployment really has never been uh, a cause for people to turn uh, to terrorism. It's not that there are not, no terrorists who are, who, are not, who are unemployed. Yes, there are terrorists who didn't have jobs, but you can never generalize about that. Hi, my name is Ryan Taney. I'm from the college. And uh, I was wondering, um, in the beginning of your speech, you talked about how it was necessary to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in order to give stability or create stability in the Middle East. And I was wondering, um, how will the recent election of Hamas um, to the Palestinian leadership, which has been deemed a terrorist organization by the United States of America and Israel, change the Saudi Arabian relationship with the Palestinian leadership, including financial aid, and will it recognize the legitimacy of this country? There are several questions there. I'll try to take them one by one. Um, let's say the issue of, of Saudi um, carrying forward support for the Palestinians and so on. King Abdullah was visiting Pakistan when the results of the uh, Hamas election victory came, and both he and President Musharraf issued a joint statement after the visit in which both of them called for the following things. One is that people must accept the results of the election. There is no two ways about it. The Palestinian people chose Hamas to be their uh, political uh, leaders. Um, two, that whatever government is formed as a result of that election, Hamas, non-Hamas, semi-Hamas, demi-Hamas, half Hamas, quarter Hamas, you name it, will have to abide by the obligations that the Palestinian Authority took upon itself. First among them being the Oslo Agreements, because that is what gives the PA its raison d'etre and its, uh, its uh, legitimacy and its recognition in the world community as a representative of the Palestinian people. And it is those agreements were between the PLO at the time, uh, led by Yasser Arafat, and Israel, led by uh, Ishaq Rabin. 
Secondly, that they must uh, abide by the Abdullah Peace Plan of 2002, uh, which calls for a two-state solution. Israeli withdrawal from, total withdrawal from Arab occupied territory in return for full Arab recognition, including Palestinian recognition of Palestine, not only as a state, but also exchange of ambassadors and normalization of relations. And third, the PA's uh, commitment to the roadmap, which also envisions a two-state solution, but puts a procedural uh, framework for how to achieve that, uh, that, uh, that aim. Um, so that's as far as how we're dealing with this issue. That message has gone to Hamas and to all Palestinian leaders that will form the next government. Um, on the issue of financial aid, we provide financial aid to the Palestinian Authority um, through international institutions like the World Bank, like there is a special fund in the United Nations for the uh, Palestinian Authority. The Arab League has commitments for the Palestinian Authority. Our aid through those institutions will continue to the Palestinian Authority. Now, the sticky point here is that your government has passed a law that considers Hamas a terrorist organization. And hence, even one member of Hamas, if he is included in a future government in, in Palestine, whoever gives aid, however indirectly it may come, to that government will be liable to American courts. And you can imagine how many lawsuits will be immediately brought if such thing were found out that Saudi Arabia had given aid, uh, even if it is through the United Nations or through the World Bank or whatever, to a government where a member of Hamas is, is, uh, is in, in, uh, in position. So it is something for your government to have to deal with. Because I don't think it would be fair for the world community um, to punish the Palestinian people for the decisions that they have undertaken in what is admittedly and witnessed as the most open and fair election in our part of the world. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Um, my name is Paula Broadwell. I'm a first year PhD student here at the Kennedy School. And you've mentioned your, your interest in Saudi Arabia's interest in peace, prosperity, and stability in the region. I'm wondering what you see Saudi Arabia's role, if there is some kind of uh, preemptive strike in Iran, or as events proceed otherwise, what is Saudi's role in uh, dealing can with you, Iran? Can you tell me what's this about Iran? I didn't get your words. I'm curious what you see Saudi Arabia's role yes. as in um, dealing with Iran, whether there's a preemptive strike or whether we resolve this diplomatically, but the, the impasse with Iran currently on the table. What I can tell you about Iran is, is what our foreign minister has said already about Iran. We're engaged in direct talks with Iran on all issues that deal with our part of the world. Our position on nuclear uh, nuclear uh, weapons is that the Middle East should be free of them, completely. And we ask all countries in the area to join us in that call. So uh, we hope that there will be no military action taken in any part of our, uh, of our area because it affects us immediately. Hi, my name is Chelsea Lay. I'm from the college. I'm wondering what you think of the recent American movie, Syriana. I saw that movie. Um, I saw it at the invitation of the, uh, the Brookings Institute, uh, the Saban Center. Uh, Mr. Martin Indyk, who, who used to be, uh, I think, Assistant Secretary of State for Middle East Affairs, invited me and my wife to see it. And we went to see it. I found it the following. First, it was disjointed. <laughs> there were just too many storylines. <laughs> and frankly, it was difficult to follow one from the other. Um, the other thing that I found about it is that it was completely a propaganda piece. And not just against the oil companies. Some here may uh, they support that kind of propaganda. 
but against our part of the world. It was as if within that framework of oil producing uh, countries in the Arabian Peninsula, there was only one person who was uh, responsible for his people or thought about their welfare and cared for their, for their uh, safety and, and, and security. And in the end, he gets killed by whom? By the United States government. So it just didn't make sense to me. And it showed a great deal of ignorance about our part of the world. There is a great deal of, of, uh, of social, economic, and political uh, fervor in the Arabian Peninsula today. And everybody is, uh, from the top down and from the bottom up, is engaged in, um, in moving forward with our societies, whether it is in political reform, economic reform, social reform, or whatever. And that didn't come about at all in Syriana. And, he, and how the, 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 I imagine, South Asian worker who was depicted as turning to being a terrorist uh, because he lives in, in, in this uh, terrible hut or whatever. There was no convincing um, uh, reasoning behind his turning to terrorism. That's what I think of Syrian. Thank you. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as salam uh, My name is Amin. I'm a student at the Harvard School of Public Health. And uh, I was actually born in Saudi Arabia. I'm Indian, but I wasn't given Saudi citizenship. And as um, and I led a very idyllic, secure life in Saudi Arabia, yet I could not help but notice that there was minimal interaction between the foreigners and the Saudis. So I was wondering if you could comment on Saudi government's initiatives to improve um, the integration between foreigners and Saudis, and possibly, um, and also what initiatives they're taking to make the foreigners feel like they're more like citizens in Saudi Arabia. I think you're absolutely right. And I think the, uh, not just our government, but our society has not lived up to the traditions or the, uh, the practices of a good Muslim uh, society in treating with our guest uh, visitors, whether they be Indians, Muslims, non-Muslims, or, or whatever. I don't have an explanation for that. Um, I think also on the part of, of, the, of, the, of the guest visitors to the kingdom, they have also been wary of interacting and engaging with, uh, with, uh, with the local population. Ideally speaking, that would not exist. But we don't live in an ideal world. And if I see how other societies treat immigrants uh, in their countries, in some ways, their treatment in the kingdom is slightly better, I think. We're going to take two more questions. Here, please. Hi. Um, my name is Ed Hamler, and I uh, represent the Lyndon LaRouche Political Action Committee. Which and one? I, Lyndon LaRouche Political Action Committee. Um, I was wondering about, uh, as the young lady brought up, the issue of Iran. Um, given that the financial system is somewhat unstable, um, and the dollar is somewhat unstable, um, I was wondering that uh, wh where would Saudi Arabia stand um, in terms of talks with the United States on this? I know you addressed the talks with Iran that you're having, but I was wondering about the talks with the United States because um, I don't think we have an interest if that's going to collapse the dollar more if the price of oil goes up um, and so forth with that kind of thing. And since a lot of the intelligence to get into the other war was cooked and things like this, um, I just wanted to know what kind of talk that you're having with the U.S., you know, maybe an impeachment of Cheney or something like that. Um, change about in, in Iran, you mean, or in Saudi Arabia? No, um, it ta ta the kind of talks you're having with yes. the United States government, and I was saying maybe uh, an impeachment of the vice president would be in order. I'll pass on that. <laughs> My name is Deborah Decker. I'm a mid-career student here. And I know Professor Allison won't let me ask two questions, so I'm going to make a statement and then ask you to uh, um, 
ask you to reply. Um, I had the pleasure of... You have my permission to ask three questions. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of visiting your country um, uh, several years ago and interviewing uh, King Abdullah, then Crown Prince. And I want to, first of all, thank you for your wonderful hospitality of everyone I met there. They were just lovely. Um, that's the good news. <laughs> The, Let's um, keep it at that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the bad news is when I interviewed people, this was as a journalist, the next level down. May I ask I, what year you were there? Uh, 2002. Oh, that's four years ago. Four years ago, ago now, yeah. Right. yeah. But what I, what I found is that more people are being educated domestically. They're not in your country rather than coming overseas. Um, the, the younger people don't have, as this other young lady had mentioned, as much exposure to Americans. And I, I found a great deal of um, hostility to, not necessarily to Americans, but to American values and, and uh, understanding of free speech and, and, of course, foreign policy, which we also have here. But um, So I was very concerned about, as you move towards more democratic elections, the nature of the, the people that will be coming in, especially in light of the fact that looking 10 years from now at possible regional balances of power in Iran and, and Israel and nuclear weapons, where do you see long term your, your country go, going and the development of it? May I just begin by saying that whatever political, economic, uh, social or other reforms and developments occur in Saudi Arabia, they will have to come from within Saudi Arabia, taking into consideration the history, the traditions, and the customs of the country and the aspirations of the people. And I think our biggest success story in Saudi Arabia is that we moved from a country of nearly 90% um, illiteracy back in 1950 to now 82% literate, and not just among the, the male population, but even among the female population. And that educational process over the last 50 years or 55 years has allowed our people, from the youngest to the oldest, from the poorest to the richest, to develop the kind of social, political, and economic aspirations and ambitions that other societies have enjoyed who were preceded us in, in, in enjoying the benefits of, of, of education. So that is how it's going to go. In, in the kingdom. It is what the people want that will, in the final analysis, decide where we head. Um, just as a note to, to you and to others, um, after September 11th, the number of Saudi students in the United States decreased by, by half. We had nearly 6,000 uh, before that. Um, 2002, we had only 3,000 not just because of, of, the, of the effects of the September 11th on Americans and Saudis and so on, but also because of the visa regulations that your government instituted um, since then, which affected not just Saudis, they affected the whole world. When King Abdullah met with President Bush last April, they agreed to ease the visa restrictions and to quicken the pace of, of, uh, of uh, procedures allowing for Saudi and uh, Saudi students and Saudi people to come to this country. And I can tell you in the last eight months since that meeting, your embassy in Riyadh has processed already more than 5,000 Saudi students to come to study in this country. Uh, when that program was initiated in the kingdom and it was announced that there were 10,000 scholarships that were going to be given to Saudi students to study abroad. 40,000 came forward to take those scholarships. So we have another five, six years to fill the, uh, the, the, the requests of, of Saudis to come here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, comments. And please join me in thanking Prince Turkey for a really pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, you must be exhausted. I hope you're <laughs> I'm looking forward to the dinner. I'm just going to have another session like this. Thank you, sir.